Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. I'll be discussing uh, scattering amplitudes and actual title will be uh, uh, in the, uh, the connection with integrability. Uh, the sort of overarching question is, is how do massless particles interact? And the context in which I would be discussing this question is in flat space. And I will be considering this from the viewpoint of a uh, perturbative picture. So we, we start from tree level and add loops and so on. Uh, a, lot, as a lot of ideas have been developed from this viewpoint because uh, there's a huge program of people making precision calculation for LHC physics. So we benefit a lot from this uh, uh, extensive study. Uh, massless particles, so there are, most particles in the world are massive, but the, describing them as massless is relevant when you describe the uh, sort of long range interaction, which for example in QCD means that uh, uh, distance much longer than inverse masses, and we also of course look at distance much smaller than one over lambda QCD when we apply And yeah, so there's a, we, there's a wide range of energy scales in QCD where the approximation particles are massless is a good approximation for, maybe not for the top quark, but for new particles. So they're very interesting to study. And these, these are the ones I will study in these lectures. Uh, but I will discuss the general case, non-supersymmetric, but a lot of progress recently has occurred Yeah, one distance smaller than lambda QCD. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so the, the other masses of the light quarks, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sorry, what is this equation? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is short distance compared to mass and, and confinement. Yeah, okay. So, uh, and there'll be a very interesting connection in a special case of uh, n course four, super young mills. Very special theory, where at least in the planar limit, there's a connection with integrable systems. So we'll be using these this general theory that has been developed for practical calculations in uh, QCD and so on to address, to, to, to discuss how we see integrability arise in this setup, in this special theory. And at the same point, at the same time, using this integrability, I think the, the, the long-term goal of this program is that we learn how to calculate in much more efficiently. Again, okay. So, That, uh, will that be okay? I would try to stick to that font. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so to start in perturbation theory, we'll start beginning at three level. And, the, and it will be very important, very useful to understand three level thoroughly. Uh, we'll be using a lot of simplification that occurs in three plus one spacetime dimensions. So when we discuss massless particle, uh, four momenta, you can write as a, uh, you can take the, uh, 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 you can construct uh, uh, the vial operator from it, which is a two by two matrix, which is of this type, P0 plus PZ, P0 minus PZ, PX plus I, PY. This is basically P slash for a vial fermion. And that two by two matrix has the property that 
if p square is massless, then that of p alpha alpha dot is equal to zero. Hence, p alpha alpha dot can be written as a product of two spinners. Again? OK. OK. So the important equation is that p alpha alpha dot is equal to a product of two spinners. Uh, and yeah, these spinners are the solution of the Weil equation. This, yeah, so there's this factorization in four dimension, which is very useful to uh, simplify notation. Uh, so we're looking at the S matrix of unshell particle. The first case is one particle goes to one particle. That's just the identity. There's nothing to say. Next case is a three point, three particle amplitude. And if you try to have three unshell particles interact in four dimensions, one, two, three, the unshell condition imposes that all momenta are zero. And since P3 is P1 plus P2, that impose that P1 dot P2 is equal to zero. And here, these lambdas, all invariants can be written in terms of these lambdas here. And P1 dot P2 is equal to what people write like this, well, where 1, 2 is equal to the antisymmetric symbol of lambda 1 alpha, lambda 2 beta. So if you antisymmetrize those two things, you, get, you make a Lorentz invariant product of these spinners. And you have the similar Lorentz invariant product of the uh, barred spinners. And all Lorentz invariant products can be written in terms of these invariants. And for the three-point amplitude, this is equal to 0, which tells you that at least one of them has to vanish. So there are two cases, which I would draw first like this. That's when, uh, well, if the case when 1, 2 is equal to 0, one can show that 1, 3 and 2, 3 are equal to 0 also. So there's a case where our angle brackets vanish. And that means that the lambda 1 is proportional to lambda 2 is proportional to lambda 3. All the lambdas are proportional. And there's another vertex in the theory in which they are, in which the lambda tilde are proportional to each other. So these are the two basic vertices. Normally, you might say that if you have a uh, three-point vertex in Minkowski space, the no normal conclusion, if you think about the real momenta, is that all the momenta have to be collinear with each other. Here, we're doing something slightly more general. If we allow the momenta to be complex, then these and these are independent cases. And now in Minkowski signature, you will have both, both of them simultaneously. But as we'll see uh, later, it's very, you will get a lot of information if we distinguish those two cases. So what are these vertices? Let's consider Yang-Mills theory, for example. So in Yang-Mills theory, the external states are labeled by uh, uh, polarization, which can be gluon as two elicity polarization, plus or minus. This Sorry? Uh, here? Here. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, square bracket is the same where, well, actually, I should write it down there. Let, let me be very correct. So it's the symmetric product of two spinners. of these two spinners. And that defines a Lorentz invariant product of these spinners. That, yeah, what's important about this product is that it's Lorentz invariant. So if we look at per yang mills so when we scatter, we have uh, polarization vectors. A good thing about this formalism is that it allows us to get rid of the polarization vector. So the amplitude doesn't depend on polarization explicitly. So what are the polarization expressed in terms of lambdas? Uh, if we have a plus polarization, you can write it as the notation. The simplest guess for a polarization vector will be something like lambda 
lambda alpha dot. That's, some, that's the simplest thing you can write in terms of lambdas. But that's proportional to p, p alpha dot. And that decouples by gauge invariance. So how do we write polarization vector? We write lambda for, actually, we write it for plus. It will be proportional to one lambda. But for the other guy, we cannot choose lambda. So we choose some arbitrary reference. And we divide by something which somehow removes dependence on this reference. So that would be the definition of polarization vector. So we had to introduce a gauge choice to write this polarization. However, it turns out that this gauge choice doesn't matter at all, and the amplitude does not depend on it. And one way to check this is if you take epsilon 1 of mu 1, if you take the difference between polarization between different polarization vectors, the difference is proportional to mu 1 alpha over mu 1 lambda minus mu 2 alpha over mu 2 lambda times lambda tilde alpha dot. And this combination, the numerator is proportional to u1 mu2 lambda, antisymmetrized in 1, 2. And there's a very useful identity, which comes from the fact that the mu's live in the two-dimensional vector space. If you antisymmetrize with respect to 2, that's equal to lambda to 1. So that way, you see that if you change the gauge choice, you get something proportional to p, and it decouples. So at the end, the amplitude doesn't depend on, never depend on this choice of mu, and it only depends on the lambda. It's very convenient. So what, are, what is the three-point vertex of the theory? Well, if we plug in this epsilon in the expression for the three-point vertex, we can compute. We get an answer, which is from the Feynman diagram. But we don't have to compute to know what the answer will be, because these lambdas have a very nice property that p is invariant under the following what's called a little group ambiguity. If you take lambda goes to e to the i theta lambda, and lambda tilde goes to e to the minus i tilde lambda, and the tilde, then p, on, p is unchanged. p goes to p. And under, actually let me put over 2 here. Under this phase ambiguity, and this is just saying that there's a phase ambiguity in choosing your spinners. Under this phase ambiguity, epsilon plus goes to eat the, let's see, epsilon plus goes to eat the minus i theta epsilon plus, and epsilon minus goes to eat the plus i theta epsilon minus. So this, ambig this phase ambiguity track what is called the elicity of the particle. The exponents are always related to the elicity of the particle. That's general. It's true for fermions also. For scalar, there's no phase ambiguity, of course. And just because of this phase ambiguity, so what do we know about this vertex here? If we take, for example, I will take this plus, plus, minus vertex. Because the lambdas are aligned, it can only depend on lambda tildes. And it has to have these phase ambiguities so that it needs to have two lambda. So this is 2, 3, 1. It needs to have lambda tilde 2, lambda tilde 3, lambda tilde 1 upstairs square. And we have to contract this into Lorentz and Warren quantity. And one can see that there's only one way, actually, to contract these things together, which is to write the following combination. Uh, sorry, um, something is wrong. Uh, one, two, three. So this vertex is proportional to the square bracket of 2, 3 cube divided by 2, 1, 2, 3, 1. Let's see. Oh, I got it backwards, sorry. Yeah, of course, yeah. Lambda tilde is on top. OK, good. Lambda tilde 2, lambda tilde 3, over lambda tilde 1. And you see, indeed, that this 
if you count the weights in two, there's three on top, two down, uh, one down, so there's two on top, two trees on top, and one down downstairs. And it's the only contraction which has this homogeneity. So without doing any calculation, the vertex has to be proportional to a number times this. And the calculation tells you what the number is. It's FABC, the structure constant. You want a minus sign? Sorry, I'm very, yeah, so throughout the lecture, I'll be sloppy with signs. I will give reference to the literature at the, uh, so there are very good uh, 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 reviews and, and, and lectures notes on this on the internet. And for the signs, I will refer to the reference. Yeah, please ignore all signs in this lecture. Yeah. And similarly, this other vertex is FABC, and now 2, 3, or 1, 2. That would be minus, minus, plus, one, two, three. Okay. So what about other possible vertices? For example, uh, plus, plus, plus. If we have this guy here and plus, plus, plus. Now it will have to be proportional to our lambda tilde is on top. That will have to be proportional to and one can see that the only thing consistent with this homogeneity is this quantity. Times some coefficient, c, uh, I don't know, one, two, three. However, in that case, the dimension of this is different. So each of these brackets has dimension one, and the two-point vertex needs to have dimension one. So c will have dimension minus two, mass dimension minus two. So this coupling here will be a, a irrelevant in the infrared. So, and I started this, this, this lecture discussing, I will discuss the long distance, I will ignore such term. So that would be a higher dimensional operator added to the theory. So you could generate this term only by adding higher dimensional operator. And for the yang bills Lagrangian, it will not appear because the coupling is dimensionless. And another case you could consider is what about minus, 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 then you get one over all that. Now the coupling constant has dimension plus four, which is really bad. And okay, as we'll see shortly, this will lead to, uh, uh, it's not consistent. You cannot find, it's inconsistent with uh, uh, four particle scattering. So I will discuss four particle in a second, but this does not, cor this does not correspond to any self-consistent theory. So uh, uh, we're not consider. So now that we discuss three point, let's move on to four particle. So we can imagine again doing the Feynman diagram calculation. Many of you I'm sure have done it and, and many, many classes ask students to do it. All the permutation of this diagram, this, this diagram. We could imagine doing this calculation and plugging in the explicit expression for this epsilon and we'll get an answer. But there's no need, again, to do it. And this is one thing I want to emphasize uh, in this lecture, is that self-consistency of the theory basically fixes the answer again. So, and, and what, what makes this possible is the fact that we're scattering particles with spin, and the spin comes with this little group ambiguity. Because of this little group ambiguity, we can say, for example, that the scattering amplitude for four particle with two, two of them negative helicity and two of them plus helicity must be equal to something which has the correct phase ambiguity and that something would be one, two, I just write, can write anything. So that, that's an example of some dimensionless thing which has the correct phase ambiguity. And then some fun function which doesn't have phase ambiguity so it depends only on S and T where S and T are the Mandelstam invariants. Well, that, 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 that's the case. And at three level, this, S, this function here would be a rational function. What can we say about it? Well, it's a rational function and we never get double poles. So we can only have single poles. One over S, one over T, one over U. Okay? 
uh, it will be dimensionless. Four particle scattering is dimensionless. In a, uh, yeah. In gen yeah, in general, the dimension, uh, yeah, in a way. Yeah. Uh, so it could be, I could write S over T, S over U. But the one for S here is actually pretty bad because S, which is, uh, I define as P1 plus P2 square, is equal to 1, 2, let me write bigger, sorry. 1, 2, 1, 2 is also equal to 3, 4, 3, 4. This as a cubic pole at 3, 4 goes to 0. And that's very bad. The physical number 2 never has anything stronger than single pole. So not only this is ruled out, but actually we need an S on the numerator of both terms. Uh, yeah. And we cannot have another constant because it's not proportional to S. So the amplitude must be of this form for two, con two constants, C1 and C2. So we don't have to do a calculation. We know the amplitude has to be like this. And this is actually very constraining because the amplitude has three factorization channels on which it must factorize. But it only has two coefficients, C1. So somehow there's some identity that's required for the theory to make sense. And consider, for example, this, what's the simplest way to fix this C1? Is to look at what happens when t goes to 0. Then this term becomes irrelevant. If you take t goes to 0, the amplitude must factorize on a product of three point vertices. And let's say that 3t is a, a let's say that a, a 2, 3 goes to 0 more precisely. And as I, as I mentioned, it's useful to consider limits in which not only particles become collinear, but consider complex momenta, where I'm allowed to take 2, 3 goes to 0, but 2, 3 fixed. If you insist the momenta are real, both of them will have to go to 0 at the same time. But we get much more con information by considering these two limits separately, and we have the right to do that because M2 is defined as a complex function. And if we take 2, 3 goes to 0, then uh, uh, the only vertex which is non-vanishing when this are 0 is this vertex. The M2 has to proportional to product of this vertex times 1 over t. And the coefficient, of course, is the structure factor here. Let's call this f. Let's see, uh, B, C, D, let's say the colors are B, C, D, A. So this is F, B, C, E, F, A, D, E. So this, this product of color factors times 1 over T. I will not evaluate the vertices explicitly, but basically the vertices as required by, as you will expect, give you exactly this, this structure so that C1 is equal to this. So you fix C1 from this factorization. Similarly, you fix C2. And that would be basically F A B, uh, sorry, F B D E F A C E over U. Uh, sorry, the one over T is, 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 is not, yeah. So the C, C is just this, this numerator. And C2 is just this. But now, so that's the U channel. So we've used these two channels and we'll fix our two coefficients. So now what do we get from the third channel? For the third channel, now we, we know C1 and C2, so we predict what the amplitude is. And the S channel, the amplitude, of course, must be proportional to uh, F A B E F. CDE. And it actually works because of the Jacobi identity. If you take C1 minus C2, you get that. Again, I'm, I'm missing thing, but the point is the theory will not make sense. You could not construct a consistent four point amplitude if the Jacobi identity was not satisfied. Uh, and the reason this, you get this kind of constraints for particles with spin is that we're forced to pull out these phases. 
And these phases always come with some pole. So the fact that we have to pull out these factors leads to these kind of constraints. And yeah, so yeah, for spin one, need the Jacobi identity. You can derive it from consistency of the four-point function. This analysis has been done later for higher spin. For spin two, you derive in this way the equivalent principle so that all particles must couple in the same way to the, uh, to the graviton. And there can be only one graviton and so on. Massless graviton. And for massless higher spins in flat space, you get that there's no solution. And the reason these constraints get so much stronger at higher spin is that you get these factors with higher and higher power. So if you have graviton, four graviton, you have some things like that. This is a quadruple pole, and you need to cook up something which cancel three powers of it for the amplitude to make sense. And it's very difficult to, can to have this cancellation without introducing poles in the other channels. So the higher the spin, the more constraints you get for massless scattering. So that, that's an a, a important lesson. Uh, okay, I have half an hour left, that's good. So let's move on to, okay, so that's the five point amplitude. We obtained it in some form in terms of uh, FABCs. Uh, at higher points, at higher points, we could keep going and just make an ANSAT and fix all the coefficients using factorization. Because we already have four points, it will somehow be useful as a building block. But there's a better way. And yeah, the reason it will work at higher points is that let me just say that uh, if you have a five-point amplitude, the dimension is minus one. In general, the dimension of the amplitude is, is equal to, uh, uh, because the S matrix is dimensionless, the S matrix is a delta function times the T matrix. So the dimension of the T matrix, the momentum considering delta function, so the dimension of the T matrix is uh, four minus uh, uh, number of particles because four comes from canceling this delta four delta function, and, and each particle is, each, each one shell state is dimension one. So, so as you go for, so this is an example, for n equal three, the three point vertex has dimension one, which is indeed what we add here. This is dimension one. The four particle amplitude is dimensionless, that we just saw. And the five particle the amplitude has dimension of one over mass, so basically, this analysis becomes more and more constraining at higher points because just by dimension analysis, you need more and more denominators at higher points. So it's just impossible to write something at five points which doesn't have a denominator. And then you, if it has a denominator, it has a pole somewhere and can constrain its poles by factorization. So the, once, you have, once you have the three-point particle, you construct the four-particle amplitude, and then all higher points are fixed by factorization. And the efficient way to solve this factorization constraint, there's at least one efficient way, is recursion relation. So that's a way to solve factorization constraints. Systematically. That's much, uh, that higher points becomes more practical than just listing all the possible structures you can have. But conceptually, it's solving, it's, basi it's doing exactly what we did by hands here for four particles. Yeah. And the idea of the recursion is to introduce, so you might think that to you, solve factorization can be difficult because the amplitude depends on many, many variables. If you have a five particle amplitude, if you scatter five particles, so two particles go to three particles, there's a lot of angles and relative energy fractions. There's a lot of variables 
that these amplitudes depend on. And if you try to solve, uh, if you try to think of it as a function of, I don't know, five complex variables, it's very, it's very difficult analysis. The trick is to restrict it, project it onto some plane, so that you look at it as a function of just one variable at a time. And so you introduce uh, one parameter, the formation of the amplitude, that, that uh, Brito, Cacheso, Feng, and Witten introduced. And this, the simplest deformation is the one they used, is you take, it's like the simplest thing you would try is just take lambda one, uh, sorry, let's take lambda n, let's define the shifted one as lambda n plus z lambda one. So that changes lambda. That, that doesn't work because total momentum is not conserved. And you have to respect momentum conservation. But we can fix it in a simple way by shifting lambda tilde one in the following way, minus z lambda tilde n. And, and so I'm, just I'm only modifying the momentum p1 and pn, but in such a way that pn of z plus p1 of z, which by dimension is lambda if I put alpha, alpha dot in this is. This is lambda n alpha of z, lambda tilde n alpha dot, plus lambda one alpha, and then lambda tilde one alpha dot at. And it's only, only these two guys depend on z. So this guy, this guy are not changed. And if you compute this quantity, so the, the lambda n, lambda tilde n term, and lambda one, lambda tilde one term are there. And then the z term, you get a cross term, which exactly cancels between those two terms. So total momentum remains conserved for all values of z. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a smart, it's really the simplest deformation that you can do, which is consistent with momentum conservation, and which, for which your particles remain on shell. P1 plus P. So if we look at the m2 as a function of, so we, now we look at m2 as a function of z. Uh, I can move here. Uh, actually, yeah, this is what I will not need. So we're looking at this amplitude as a function of, of z. So what can we say about this amplitude? It has a bunch of poles. And the poles come from when uh, in some channel, all the poles in, the, in an amplitude comes from factorization. So we will have some diagram on the left where and at Sorry, let me put one at, two, a bunch of labels here. Let me call these labels I. Can you see or it's too I? Let me call this set of label I. And then there's some amplitude on the other side where N at shifted momenta and other stuff here. So all these. All these poles occur when the momentum in that propagator go to zero. So the poles are P1 at of Z plus PI, total momentum in that channel, is equal to zero. And, because, and that is a linear polynomial in Z. Because, P, yeah, P1, yeah, this is basically P1 plus pi square plus two, the cross term here gives you two z times what I call, what you can write like this. Where this by definition is the vector which corresponds to lambda one, lambda tilde n, alpha, alpha dot, dotted into pi. 
So that notation should be, uh, I hope it's intuitive. If anyone's confused by it, just, just please stop. But the point is that, yeah, that, that, that is what this notation is. So the pole condition is that this is zero, and the point is that this is linear equation in Z, so it's easy to solve. So that deformation is very convenient. So in the complex plane, we have a bunch of poles, and yeah, because yeah, in general, the solutions are complex. There's a bunch of poles, and there's one pole for each channel in which one is on one side and then the other side. And the residue of each pole we know, at least recursively, because it's a lower point amplitude. It's a product of two things that are lower points. So we know all the poles. So if we're lucky, if AZ goes to infinity, uh, if AZ goes to zero, at Z goes to infinity, then from all its poles, we can reconstruct what A is. And okay, an equation which demonstrates that is the equation if, if this limit is true, then this is true, and that is equal to A of zero plus sum over the poles, one over Z on the pole times A times the residue. So from the residues, which are product of amplitudes, we can reconstruct the function, what we want, which is the function, the undeformed amplitude, the function here at z equals zero. Sorry, I'm tilting down. So the solution to that can be written very uh, uh, much, can be written in a uh, compact form. Yeah, let me, yeah, let me erase this, and the solution Basically, yeah, the statement is that a n is equal to sum over all the channels i of the of an amplitude on the left, which depends on particle one, all the particles in i, and and some intermediate label which call m. Some amplitude on the right. Let me write it here. M and then uh, let's call this J and then N at. It's evaluated at the shifted momenta. And in front, there's just the pole P1 plus uh, the total momenta in that channel square, which is just this propagator. So that's a recursive. formula for three amplitudes. So I will keep that thing. Uh, I, will not, I will not need that, but I will just need to keep the vertices here. And I will keep the four point episode here also. So, yeah, so I have fifteen minutes left, so I will briefly discuss the simplest solution of this equation. And yeah, and, and, there, and, and there are, yeah, for the simplest helicities. Uh, and at the same time, I will introduce a useful concept, which is that of color order amplitude. So if we look at the four particle amplitude, it involves this gauge theory structure constants, and a good way to deal with them is to, so for example, if we have this structure constant, is to write it as a trace of generators. This can be written as trace, if we, if we, yeah, if we write that E and F and delta EF, you can write this, this like that. And using that delta EF is trace of TE, TF. 
you can write that as TA, TB, TC, TB. So it's a trace of a of product of two commutators. That gives you this environment up to a normalization, which I will not, not bother with for yeah, not, not to lose too much time. And this you can expand basically as this trace TA, TB, TC, TD, minus, plus, and some other guys. And what is called the color order amplitude is the coefficient of this guy in the expansion of the amplitude. So there is n minus 1 factorial color order amplitude. So in other words, you write the amplitude as sum over trace, well, sum over permutation of n minus 1 particles. There's three. Well, it's called T A1, T sigma A2, T sigma A N, times the amplitude, uh, times the amplitude for one sigma A2 sigma A N. And it's N minus permutation of N minus one guy because the trace is cyclic, you can always put one guy first. And actually, the, the, the trace is a flip symmetry. It's really it, it's this really number, but but yeah. But basically, each of these am, each of these cyclic amplitude is defined, and it has the uh, symmetry under under reversing the order. So these amplitudes here are contrary to. The reason they are, the main reason they are useful is that they are unambiguous. Because if you look at this amplitude here, you can define C1 as a quotient of this and C2 as a quotient of this in a basis where these are your two building blocks. But you could use the Jacobi identity to rewrite this as this minus this. And then this quotient C1 will be different. So the quotient of these Fs is not uniquely defined because of the Jacobi identity. But this coefficient here are unambiguous. So they are, they are, are, yeah, yeah. And one, one simple way to see that they are unambiguous is to imagine you have SUN gauge theory where N is big enough, SUNC, if NC is greater than number of particles you're scattering. And if you consider the scattering amplitude where particle one is just above the diagonal like that. TA2 is equal to the next guy just above the diagonal and so on. Then out of all these products, the only products which survive would be TA1, TA2, TA3 and so on. So just by evaluating the amplitude on that specific configuration of color, you extract this. So that shows that it's completely unambiguous. And yeah, in string theory, these are what would correspond to uh, uh, an amplitude with the topology of the disk, and the ordering is the ordering of the vertex operators on the outside of the disk. So this was inspired in the 80s by, by this. But it's, yeah, it's a, useful, it's a useful notation in gauge theory. And for the four particle amplitude, if you compute this guy and write it in terms of angle brackets, it turns out to have a very simple expression. which is just 1, 2 to the 4, divided by 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1. This is basically what uh, this C1, yeah, it's basically, yeah, it's basically what this S over T times this is. It's not, uh, it doesn't come deeper than that. Yeah, this, this compact and elegant expression. Uh, and for solving the recursion, it's also relatively, uh, uh, this notation also helps because you have much fewer factorization channels which preserve a given ordering. So, yeah. so if you want to compute 
basically, you have to write down factorizations which preserve the cyclic ordering. So for if you deform in N1, you have only have three channels for the five particle amplitude. One of them is one, actually just two channels, sorry. One, two, three, four. And the other is one, two, three, four. So, so in the planar limit, the number of factorization channels is, is very small. It's just number of particles minus three. And if you consider a particularly simple elicity structure, sorry, I'm overlapping. The simplest, actually, I don't need this anymore. Now that I've written this, <laughs> that's better. So just as a one illustration of the recursion validation, discuss the amplitude where you have, see, all but two particles are plus elicity, when everybody has the same elicity, but two guys. This will turn out to be a simple generalization of this formula. And what happens in this special case is that, let's write, let's put the elicities here. This is one, two. So one is minus, two is minus, three is plus, and these are plus. And this is minus, minus, plus, plus, plus again. What you see is that this is a four point amplitude with a minus, with three plus and one minus. And this, I haven't discussed it so far, but it's actually zero, and you can basically show by showing that it cannot have any pole. It's uh, I leave that uh, inside. So give us different arguments, but yeah. This is zero, so this amplitude is zero. There's just one diagram, it's this one. And this is non-zero because we have a plus, plus, minus three-point vertex, which is non-zero, and this is a minus, minus, plus, plus vertex, which we just computed given by this guy. So this amplitude yeah. So let's evaluate this graph. So we get one over the total momentum in that channel, which is P4 plus P5 square. We're evaluating this factor in front. And one over P4 plus P5 square is one over Four five, four five. Uh, yeah, yeah. Here yeah, I just have five pluses. Then there's a factor which is the amplitude on the left. So I'll just write a four, one at two, three. Let's call this guy intermediate guy, middle guy M. And then there's the this amplitude on the right which is the three-point vertex given here. Yeah. Which is plus plus, so the two plus, the two same go on top, and five is shifted, and downstairs there's four M, M, five. This we know, so basically we just have to evaluate this. So what is the momentum five on the solution? So, sorry, uh, yeah. what is the momentum? We need to know five, just a second, uh, yeah. We need to know five at, and we need to know, to know four. Seems like I miss one information here. Let me just check. Yeah, okay. One thing which we can see on the pole, actually very simple, is that since we've deformed lambda, 
What is zero in the pole on that white vertex here? We have that four phi vat, sorry, m phi vat is equal to zero on the pole. So that tells us that m, remember that m is defined up to rescaling, is, sorry, wait a second. Just, 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 just wait a second, yeah. Is equal to zero and the five phi vat is not, sorry. Five vat is deformed. Yes, I've got it. Okay. okay, that's what I was missing. Okay. So the in this deformation I deformed five, but not five at. It's not five tilde, sorry. So this angle bracket with five is undeformed. The only thing I need to compute is this M. Yeah. And that that uh, that is known. This five at is such that four times five at is equal to zero because I'm on this factorization book. And that basically tell me, and also four m is equal to zero. So I can take m, well, I can take m equal to four, or to a choice up to an irrelevant phase. Because m, lambda, lambda, this is a sh shortened, sorry, for lambda m is equal to lambda 4 alpha. That's true because they're proportional to each other and the overall normalization doesn't matter. The overall normalization cancels between, the overall phase ambiguity cancels between these two factors. So I can take this. And what, I, what can I say about m? Well, the vector m is p4 plus p5 at. And it's a null vector. So to extract its lambda tilde, I can project it on anything. And the convenient thing to projecting on is p1, sorry, p4 plus p5 at. If I project it on 1, and that's convenient because then the shift disappears. Because the shift of P5 is proportional to lambda 1. So I can just write it like that. And now I'm done. And okay, I actually have to normalize it such that uh, this product is equal to this. And basically normalization, you can work it out, but it just, the, just whatever, you, the simplest thing you will think, which cancel the weight respect to 1 and 4. I'm, I'm saying this because you can do this calculation, but after you've done it once, you can basically guess the answer. So I'm telling you how to guess it, which I think is more useful. So M is this. And if we plug this into this factor, a brief algebra shows that, uh, well, yeah. When we compute 4M, let's, let's actually do it. 4, 5 cube, 4M, for 4m, the 4 cancel here. So we have 4, 5, 1, 5. 4, 5, 1, 5. And for the other guy, we also get 4, 5, but 1, 4. And now we have 1, 4 squared from this guy two times. That cancels this. That's a 1. The 4, 5, two of them cancel. And this 4, 5 cancels this. So in the end, if I write there, you will not see, so I will write here. In the end, we just get that A5 is equal to 1 over 4, 5. This and this cancel. Then there's 1, 5, 4, 5, 5, 1. And then there's 4, 1 on top times A4 of what, 1 minus, 2 minus, 3 plus, 4 plus. And again, this only lambda tilde 1 is shifted, but A4 depends only on A, on lambda 1. So the, the, you can ignore the at here. So the solution of this recursion relation is very simple. Well, so A5 is, and yeah, let, let's write it explicitly just so that you remember the pattern.
So basically, the 4, 1 cancels this, and the product gives you 1, 2 to the 4, times 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 1. So the cyclic product of denominators. And obviously, this recurses, and you can keep going. So that's a, this, for the simplicity, this class of amplitude, this, this family of amplitude is given by this one line proctator formula, which is credited to proctators who guessed it from a aeroric six point calculation in the 1980s. It's very, uh, very, very difficult, very, uh, they really have to pull all all the tricks and you use extensive computer power to manage to get this result by Feynman diagrams. But the end result is rather simple. But you can apply this recursion relation not just to this elicity, but actually at five point they're more or less all simple, but even for six point you can have more complicated things. And, and for all, all of these elicities, you, this formalism gives you rather compact formulas, and which just are Encumberedly simpler to what you would get from summing Feynman diagram. So this is the efficient way to think about about three answers. So not only you get answers quickly, but you get answers which are compact enough that you can actually stare at them. Uh, okay, so I was planning to discuss some supersymmetry, but I would conclude here. So. Yeah, so all I've said today is there's no supersymmetry. Uh, it's very, uh, uh, it's very, very quite general. We discussed uh, amplitude in three level Yang Mills theory. Uh, and the reason trees are so important, well, first of all, you see that they're quite simple. They're much simpler than what you would think from Feynman diagrams. So you want to use them as a building block to compute loops. So what I will discuss in the next lectures is how you go from trees to loops and trying to exploit this, uh, uh, this simplicity. And I will make contact with integrability in the special case of n equals 4. So that's roughly the, the plan of these, these lectures. Uh, thank you.